Chapter 6 Homework and Conclusion Homework Assignment A Assuming you have made it this far and completed this first section of this manual, I would like to assign some reading before you continue to the next section. The reason for this homework is to drive home the concept that the thing that public sees as government is not the state, and indeed, it is not even government. The political process, with all its politicians, its posturing, its political campaigns, its elections, and all of its quasi-religious ceremonies, is in fact an elaborate opera played out by actors for your entertainment. The entire show is nothing more than an ongoing intravenous drip of political opiates to keep the public in a stupor. Actual government policies are the result of a hidden government made up of unelected semi-permanent bureaucrats who kindly play along with the politicians while doing almost all of the work of running the apparatus of government. If you complete this homework assignment, you will find the above statement is not a wild-eyed, foil-hat conspiracy. It is simply how the real world of government works, and if you complete this assignment, you will see a major flaw in the very fabric of government that is just waiting for someone to yank the thread and unravel the whole cloth. The Assignment Read, or at least skim the short book, National Security and Double Government by Michael Glennon, 2014. Michael Glennon is Professor of International Law at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University. He is a respected Washington, D.C. policymaker and insider. He is not an anarchist, he is not a conspiracy wacko, and he is not a whistleblower with an axe to grind. He is a solid statist who is being brutally honest with his colleagues and describing a flaw that he perceives in American government. Although insightful in regards to the national security intelligence state, and revealing in his indictment of the process of selecting U.S. Supreme Court justices and U.S. presidents, Michael Glennon seems to ignore or not be aware of the struggle between the hidden government that he talks about and the public government in the post-World War II years, culminating in the assassination of a sitting U.S. president. Perhaps he didn't want to muddy the waters with the topic, but ignoring such an event in conjunction with his lacking an assessment of the obvious meddling by the central banks and their owners in regards to monetary policy, and the massive influence of the military-industrial complex, the pharmaceutical complex, the energy complex, and the industrial farming interests have all played, is disturbing to say the least. Again, perhaps there were constraints in time, or perhaps he chose to only focus on the national security intelligence issues because of his target audience, or perhaps because he wished to keep the discussion in his realm of excellence. For whatever his reason, and considering the precision in his assessment, it is sad that he didn't follow through to a better conclusion than to just say that voters should be better educated. This failure stands out most dramatically when you consider that he never even once hints at the incredible level of aggression and violence that his so-called Trumanites have relied upon to gain and maintain their grip on governments. Also, when you consider that the very system of Trumanites that he describes existed in America before the date he points to as their official birth, and in fact controlled major aspects of the American government long before Harry Truman was born, his warnings seem far too little, far too late. And again, to assume more education could be the solution, considering the American education system was one of the first targets of the hidden government in the late 1800s, seems like a weak conclusion at best. More to the interest of readers of this manual is the glaring weaknesses inherent in the American government that Glennon so carefully and accurately points out. From his article, quote, The aim of this article thus far has been to explain the continuity in U.S. national security policy. An all-too-plausible answer, this article has suggested, lies in Bagahot's concept of double government. Bagahot believed that double government could survive only so long as the general public remains sufficiently credulous to accept the superficial appearance of accountability, and only so long as the concealed and public elements of the government are able to mask their duality and thereby sustain public deference. As evidence of duality becomes plainer and public skepticism grows, however, Bagahot believed that the cone of governance will be balanced on its points. If you push it ever so little, it will depart further and further from its position and fall to the earth. End quote. Restating Walter Bagahot, Glennon lays out for us what we should already know. Modern Western-style government is entirely based on the lie that visible politics run governments, when actually the hidden and plain sight truth is that visible politics play almost no role in the actual policies of government, and the most important point of both Bagahot and Glennon being that the whole house of cards is at risk of collapse if the public fully figures it out. That leads us to the point of this manual, how to capitalize on that wonderful weakness and shove the cone of governance off of its balance point so that we may all shout with glee as Humpty Dumpty tumbles to the earth. Homework Assignment B. Think of ways you can assist the underground without being directly connected to the underground. Here are some examples, but see if you can think of more. Number one, do you know or have an interest in lockpicking? This would be a great skill set to learn and teach to those in the underground. Number two, 
Are you an actor or are you talented in that art? Could you develop acting troops that could use their talent in the underground? You could practice at Liberty Functions and get together by fooling your participants into thinking you were building inspectors, FBI agents, or worse. Above-ground activists with experience in specific fields can work as advisors, as in, how do corrections officers behave? How do federal marshals transport prisoners? How do police talk to each other when no one is listening? For example, the movie Burn After Reading lost my attention when the great character actor, J.K. Simmons, played the unnamed CIA supervisor and began to talk. The few CIA operators I have known were nothing like that. The CIA agents I have encountered use very clean language. They were Mormons, and they were very dedicated and straight-laced, all business, all the time. In my experience, as good of an actor as J.K. Simmons is, I wouldn't believe for a second that he was an actual CIA agent. Under the right circumstances, a mistake like that could cost an activist dearly. Number three, medical personnel, specifically those with trauma and emergency room experience, can hold classes teaching emergency first aid to members of the underground. Number four, organize the ambassador system with other anarchist and activist groups to provide them services during demonstrations, riots, and other times. Perhaps film crews, news coverage, medical assistance, logistics, communications, alerts about police movements, or other services could be offered without getting directly involved in the causes or their demonstrations. Note on other groups. Do not repeat the mistake Rothbard made with the racist right. Infiltrate them, but do not water down our movement by evangelizing them. Do not trust them. Invade their circles, but do not let them in ours. Number five. Train rescue teams before demonstrations, riots, so that teams can rush in and remove injured protesters before they can be arrested, possibly even after they are arrested. Training teams for spotting agents provocateur, identifying shadow teams, and even shadowing these shadow teams while communicating their movements could be very important. Identifying arrest teams and communicating arrest team movements before they act, and even possibly training teams to disrupt the arrest teams could be invaluable. Number six, the greatest tool for liberty is your mind. Open it, take it out, and play with it. Remember, each of us has our own minds, but the state does not own such a tool. Conclusion On the physical and economic levels, the state is an inherently unstable parasitic collaborative of politicians, bureaucrats, and select corporations, along with a subservient media, clergy, and intelligentsia that relies upon a combination of extortion, intimidation, threats, and violence to dominate its human host. In doing so, it distorts markets, stifles competition, discourages innovation, and through manipulation of the money supply and debt, siphons the lion's share of wealth into the pockets of a tiny group of central banking families while destroying a good portion of the wealth that it doesn't steal. On a metaphysical level, the state, whether real or imagined, is a faith-based deity existing in the minds of its believers, generally based on a combination of the adoration of a great man along with an illogical fear of a boogeyman in conjunction with an unblinking faith in the political process. That faith, in turn, relies on a dramatic opera-like performance on the part of politicians as they attempt to appear relevant, while the shadow government of bureaucrats and corporate banking puppet masters attempts to remain unseen. All the while, the state struggles to provide services it claims the monopolistic right to provide, while miserably failing at providing those services. On the occasion that the state's true nature is revealed and its failures exposed, it always responds by sending in waves of lies by actors on all levels while systematically discrediting, beating down, or murdering anyone who shines the light on those failures. The state relies on an incredibly delicate balancing act between the disinterest of its victims, the imagery of a functioning political process, and faith in government-led progress towards some mythical idea of a better tomorrow, in contrast with the reality of a non-functional puppet political process and an ever-growing, ever-consuming beast driving humanity toward worldwide slavery at best and species-wide destruction as a very real possibility. In the past, there have been four basic strategies for defeating the state, none of which actually provide a mechanism for defeating the state, while two of those strategies are either non-productive or, more commonly, destructive and counterproductive to our cause. This manual proposes a fifth strategy based on the idea that it is possible to upset that balance by simply waking up both the disinterested and the faithful public. This is accomplished by prodding the powers that be into overreactions while boldly proclaiming the failures and lies of the current system. This manual posits that this process is inherently dangerous as the, st- as the state, having its basis in violence and hate, will react y- using extreme measures. Further, this manual posits that the primary members and leaders of the state will react in varying levels of panic and desperation as their positions of power become more and more unstable. 
Finally, this manual posits that in self-defense, specific activists will of necessity be required to take actions that none of us would like to think about. In self-defense, those actions will be violent, bloody, and will encompass the power structure of the state and its supporting apparatus. Concluding, this manual is a first attempt to motivate and train those brave activists who will accomplish this three-part task. This manual is not exhaustive nor complete. It is in need of revision and modification by those who are committed to this fight and knowledgeable of the processes herein outlined. End Part 1, Peaceful Sedition.